Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will run approximately 60 minutes including question and answer time at the end. It will also be available in the Events Industry Council's YouTube. All attendees today will receive their CEs approximately one week after the webinar. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I would like to address a few logistical items. Attendees can listen to the webinar through their computers or by dialing in using the number and passcode provided by the Zoom software. If you have questions, you do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to submit them. We always encourage you to submit your questions using the question box seen on the screen. We will address as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. We also welcome you to utilize the closed captioning function. Click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and you will find the link to the subtitles. And now I'll hand it over to our CEO of Events Industry Council, Amy Calvert. Amy? Thank you, Derek. Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited. We have a group of almost a thousand people registered for this program, so well done to the team here today. Um, I just wanted to start out by, again, welcoming everyone and, and thanking, of course, our team at the Events Industry Council, but our, also our amazing group of volunteers that support EIC on an ongoing basis, in particular today, our Apex Business Recovery Task Force members. What an amazing group of volunteers that have put their hearts and souls into compiling this work that we've done over the past few months on behalf of the industry. They really have um, been tremendous supporters and, and really um, wanting to do the best that they can to support the workforce and, and our industry and to really remind everybody about our resilience and our, and our ability to adapt and transform. And I think that's what's so inspiring about this next release. So this will be our third. Um, we've had uh, a guide on meeting and event design. We've had a guide on uh, hotels, safety protocols, and so forth. But today is all about workforce and wellness and this amazing group of people that made that happen. Um, really, I think the notion about the APEX work to date is it's about aggregating and curating the resources um, on behalf of our, our global workforce. And uh, the Events Industry Council members, which you can see on our next slide, have done a lot of fabulous work on behalf of the industry. I'm so proud to represent these organizations that have all brought forth tremendous resources. Again, the Apex Recovery Task Force, the intention is to aggregate and curate accepted practices and protocols so that there is a single source, a repository, and I, and I, and I want to really emphasize the, this notion about a single source and a repository and ease of access. All of this work uh, resides on our website and uh, can easily be tapped into by, by anybody. It's open source content. So again, today, you know, my um, role here is just to, to thank these amazing group of volunteers that you see here, our panelists, to remind everybody that um, together we are stronger. You know, the, these guides um, are meant to really be um, a resource for the industry at an unprecedented time. Uh, I think that we all know that um, we have seen things that are unlike those um, challenges that we've seen in the past. But what gives me comfort, personal comfort, is knowing that um, the individuals such as the folks that are, have joined us here today and all the folks on our task force are willing to come together and give of their time to make sure that we're moving in the right direction as we move forward. And this conversation really today to me represents hope, it re represents inspiration, and um, the notion that our industry is truly grounded in partnerships and relationships. And I think that's one of the things we know we all love so much about it. So without um, a further delay, I want to turn it over to our co-chair, Kristen Horseman. I'm sure many of you know Kristen, but she's been a tremendous leader of this task force, and she will moderate today's panel and uh, lead us through a really, a really important conversation. So thank you all again for joining us, and I'll be back at the end of the program. Kristen, over to you. Thanks, Amy, and uh, I echo your uh, appreciation for you know, we wouldn't be able to, you know, do in this um, without your team and your leadership. So thank you. Um, I also want to introduce and thank the um, panelists here. So we have a lively group. They're not shy. So I'm super excited um, to first introduce Mike Gretto. Um, you might hear me say Gretto throughout um, uh, the webinar. We're, we're good buddies, but he's founder and managing director of Chat Hills Company. Say hey, Mike. And then we got Tony Lorenz, he's founder of, um, of Headsail. 
I got Tim Matthey, who's a senior partner at Speak Inc. We've got Rachel Riggs, who's well-being leader at Merit's Global Events. And to round out, we've got Johnny White, who's CEO and Executive Vice President of the American Society of Appraisers. So super excited um, about this, this topic today. I think we have all been affected. And you know, whether you have a job, you don't have a job, um, you're, you're, you're just surrounded um, through what we've gone through in the last six months. And it's, we're all in it. That's the one thing I think we all have to, to understand. This isn't one person. We are all dealing with it. And so today is really going to be an open, raw, authentic conversation. And we want to hear from you. We want to, you know, you, you got the, the chat function. So tell us what you're dealing with, what you, your questions that you have. But we're going to spend the next um, about 50 minutes for Rachel and Johnny to give us just highlights of the book. I'm, I, this book is great, you guys. The amount of resources. I was actually watching some videos this morning. And there's so much great resources. It's going to take you a while to get through, but Johnny and Rachel are going to highlight that for us. Then we're going to open it up, and, and I've got some topics that I want each of the, the um, uh, panelists to talk about, um, and then we're, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So that's kind of how we're going to spend our time together. So I'm going to turn it over to Rachel and Johnny to kind of help us um, look at how we came together with the wellness and the workforce and all the great stuff that's in the book. Thank you, Kristen. Nice to see everybody on the chat, and thanks for being here. Johnny and I have um, worked together on this book with this team, and we're very, very proud of the work that has come out. The guidebook will come out um, hopefully by the end of the day. Amy will touch on that at the end of this session. Um, we just want to give you a high level of the guidebook. So, Johnny, you want to talk about the purpose and how to use it? Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Kristen. And, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with Rachel and the entire team and putting this, this book together. And it's going to be, again, a, a resource for the industry, um, you know, no matter where you are in your, uh, the situation that you're dealing with right now, from being furloughed to being unemployed um, to being um, um, uh, working. I'm still working, but, you know, inundated with more work at this time. Um, so this is, this is what our mission was when we put this book together to provide some resources on the different areas that will help you get through these times. Um, so we broke it down into different sections. Uh, the first section that you'll find in the book is the duty of care. And what we're looking at there is, you know, what is the meeting planner's responsibility during these times? What is the individual's responsibilities at this time? Um, what are the providers' uh, responsibilities, such as hotels, venues, transportation? Um, and we've looked at all of those different areas, and as you'll see in this uh, duty of care, there is uh, information on duty to research, duty to inform, duty to recommend, and duty to plan. And that's kind of the, the standards around duty of care. Great. And then the next section, you'll find the frameworks for the workforce, wellness, and well-being. And we've talked about um, how we've all had to go back to the basics since the pandemic started. And if you remember in your psychology class, the Maslow's theory of the hierarchy of needs, we've put some basic information in there and gone back to the pyramid because in the beginning, we were all at the top of the pyramid. Now we're at the very bottom of the pyramid of these needs. And we have to be health, uh, we have to talk about our health, our safety. And we talk a little bit about this in the book to give you a little bit of a framework. And Basically, what we're doing as well in this section is offering some framework for you to think about how to take care of yourself. In this world, we're so overwhelmed by so much, and so we're trying to give some frameworks to help you think about how to break it down to make it a little bit easier. And then another section is rescaling. I mean, all of us are dealing with, you know, what do we do next? Um, you know, we're now getting inundated with virtual programs, you know, what we're doing right now. Um, we don't think this is going to go away. So, you know, how do we upskill to ensure that we are uh, developing programs um, with that in mind? Um, or are you rescaling it? You're having to learn something new. And you've been working on your job for the last 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is, and now things have changed. So you have to look at, again, the rescaling or upskilling. So there's a section in there um, which we pulled from the World Economic Forum and that's talking about reskilling and the, and the revolution of that. I mean, as you can see, you know, we've 
this, this, this book that we put together, we really brought in or created a lot of resources from the leaders, the experts out there to help us um, help you in navigating you know, what you got to go through right now. Another section I think is really important that we put together is assessing your situation. Some key questions to ask yourself, things to think about, and um, places to find answers. And so we put that section together just to give people thought starters. All right, and then this next section is probably one of my favorite sections because it's really hearing from uh, the volunteers, uh, this, this team that put this book together. And what we've done is we've put together some inspirations um, that's helping us during this time. Hopefully, we'll, um, you'll be able to take in and use as inspirations as you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with. So, you know, definitely take a look at that. And, and there's some videos associated with our inspirations and then um, some links to some of our inspirations. And additionally, what we've done is we've broken down all of the resources by five different um, dimensions, if you will, um, looking at your career, looking at your financial situation, looking at your network and your social situation, and your personal health situation. So we've provided resources and links to all of those. So we find that this um, is a very valuable section of the book. Right. And then, as I stated earlier, you know, this, this book is bringing in a lot of the resources that we found. This is not a, just a U.S. centric uh, book. It's a global book. So you'll find a section that has a uh, global multinational and uh, national public health agencies. Um, you know, we want to get go to the experts when we need information. And, and now we've broken it down in this section by um, different regions. And then finally, my, one of my favorite sections is the EIC member links. And in the book, you'll find the resources that include all the job banks for all the, the various members of the EIC, scholarship information, and relief information. So please, when you get the book, just look through every section and also I encourage you to talk to us as we um, are available to help and guide and um, just share those resources with you. So. Um, that is the wrap-up of the book. <laughs> the only other thing I will say about the book, it's a living document. Um, as you'll see in some of the sections, going back to the global one, I mean, if there's an area that we missed and you know of an agency there, please reach out to us because we can add this information um, to the books. Rachel and Johnny, when, uh, when we started this, you were two separate work streams, workforce and we were doing the wellness. And then it was decided like this it actually should come together. What, tell us why you thought the two need to be married together. Uh, well, I'll start with that. I mean, I was leading the workforce task force, and as we were looking at the workforce, and again, we were asking the question, you know, where are you in this workforce? Are you working, are you furloughed, or are you um, not working at all? Um, and as we were going through that process, you know, we were thinking about those individuals and um, how are they – being able to take care of themselves during this time. And that's kind of we started leading towards, we need to figure out how we're going to uh, identify, you know, wellness for these individuals. And so that really started to make sense as we knew there was another task force that was just dealing with well, uh, wellness. So it was a, an easy uh, collaboration because we were going down that path anyways. Absolutely. And I think it was a, a, a perfect fit for the state of the industry right now. Great. So I do want to take a quick poll. Our first question is, how uh, if you um, have lost your job due to COVID? I think uh, the team's going to pop that up. If you can respond to that question, we just kind of want to understand um, how many people have actually been affected. Do we see the results somewhere? Wow. So about 50% have not been affected, uh, reduced hours, about 15 um, furloughed, and then I have been laid off, so about 25% uh, of this audience. Um, so this is going to take us into our first you know, topic, is kind of the job loss and that personal care. And I really want um, Rachel and Mike to kick this off. And I think, Mike, I want to start with you, because I, uh, I first met you when you were working at Coca-Cola, um, this major iconic brand. And, you know, 
over the last couple of years, you know, you lost, you know, your job with um, Coke and then your career over the last couple of years and where you are now, I just feel like you have a really powerful story that I'd love for you to, to share and kind of talk about what you, you know, you've gone through. Thanks, Kristen. I mean, I honestly thought I was on my interview for my new cooking show. Like, is this not the interview for the cooking show? I guess I'm on a panel. Um, anyway, trying to be funny here. But yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, being, being a guy in the industry um, uh, who has, has gone through a tremendous learning opportunity working for like a really great iconic brand, um, it, it, it affects you. Like the first time I was uh, laid off, I've been laid off a couple times. I feel like I've mastered that, right? Um, but I've always reinvented myself and like was able to move forward and do things a little bit differently. Um, but you and I kind of talked about my first layoff experience and I will tell you it impacted me dramatically, you know, because I was prepared for it and I had kind of, I had 14 years at the company in two different roles and traveled the world and had done everything. And so I was ready for my next challenge. And I think the hard thing is, is that, you know, this group, our industry is so used to change at the end of the day when change comes about um we're used to it you know the content changes the meeting venue changes something happens um it's we should be embracing the fact that something bigger is telling us or moving us to a better place and i think that's one of the things that you know has really helped me along the way i will tell you my ego was shot to hell when i first got laid off uh, because then I saw some other people in the company and it's thinking to yourself, how, how are, how did my job get impact when, you know, we, this isn't a nine to five job. We work all the time. We work on weekends. We work late nights. We travel. We're away from our family. We're away from our children. We're away from our friends. And this is a, this is a passionate industry. And when you get furloughed or laid off, I mean, it affects you, at least affected me, it affected me for probably about three months. Now I was lucky enough to get a great severance package and then get another job. Uh, within a month and a half. And so it was kind of like the double dip there, which was really fantastic. Uh, but at the same time, I still harbored a lot of anger and bitterness. And, you know, it's, it's almost like going through a death. You're going to go through the seven phases. And, uh, and for me, it's having a great spouse. My wife's an entrepreneur. So she's been on a roller coaster ever since she started her businesses and her companies. And uh, it's, I've had a really great spouse that have been able to like sit down and really have deep conversations with that, with her and say, you know, why is this happening to me? And like her, her point when, when these, this has happened to me multiple times has been, you're in the industry of change. Like, you know, everybody has comfort levels in staying where they are and what they're doing and know how to manage their teams. If, if you're managing a team or if you're an independent individual contributor, you've got that ability to be able to be comfortable. And I think for me over the last seven months with COVID, it is every single day for me has been uncomfortable because I am teaching myself new things. I am involving myself in probably so much that I almost feel like a jack of all trade and a master at none because quite frankly, I'm just trying to stay busy and keep motivated and moving forward. I'm currently consulting. I have one great client who uh, had the courage to be able to pull back their customer advisory board and say, we're doing it live come hell or high water in December and we're gonna be socially distant and we're gonna make the choice of the advisors to come in. It's gonna be their choice to come in. And, and, and be here. And if they don't, then we'll try to build a, a hybrid program for them so that they can feel like they're participating. But at the end of the day, it was about choice. And I think for me and, and Kristen, you know, just jump in here. It is, it is staying on, it is managing the uncomfortableness of not being comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. I have been comfortable for such a long time in such a, in, in multiple roles that that comfort level is easy to stay into. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, I realize now that I have to embrace being uncomfortable and it is, it is awful because it is, there are times where I want to have that comfort level. You want to have the two week salary, you know, the paycheck coming in, you want to have the bonus, you want to be able to have that health care and that big brand behind you because essentially I was the, I was considering myself that brand. I wasn't considering myself as Mike Gretto. And I think that is a huge thing that has, has helped me along the way. Yeah. I want to pull Rachel in uh, now because Rachel has, you know, uh, similar but different in the fact that, like, I've known Rachel, you know, since I started my little baby career. And, um, she, you know, she was Vancouver, you know, when you think Vancouver, you think, you know, Rachel, and then, you know, you got this dream job, going to go work at Merit and, and focus on wellness and well-being. And like, this is what you started out in your career with. And now, now what? And then you're a mom, you're 
you're sending your daughter off to college, she gets COVID, you're dealing with, you know, an elderly mom, like you've got a lot on your plate. So uh, tell us how you have been dealing, you know, with all of this. Sure. Um, thanks, Kristen. Uh, great story, Mike. Um, mine is a little bit different. I was started off with my dream job, as Kristen said. I was ready for an amazing year. At uh, In January, February, I was in, um, happy with where things were going. I'm the chapter president of the Greater Midwest Chapter of PCMA. My family was doing great things. She just got accepted to the University of Colorado Boulder. And I was just like, yay. So I start my job on March 2nd. And um, then March 10th hit, we had a PCMA event. We had 250 people there. It was fabulous, but we kept hearing this COVID word and you know, not sure what that meant. And um, then it all came really real to me when March Madness was canceled. <laughs> I was like, what? Didn't seem right, you know? I was just like, that's my favorite thing. And I was just like, what is going on? And, um, you know, and then everything started canceling, proms, graduation, client events, like every time we turned around. And I kept saying, you know, I felt like we were in a tailspin, like we all have. And then on March 29th, I was furloughed from my dream job. And I got it. I totally understood what was happening and, and couldn't, I was sad. I was very sad, but I couldn't do anything about it. And I felt very out of control. Um, and in our world, we need to control things. It's our desire, <laughs> right? And so I felt this um, really sense of, of, of confusion. And I had never been laid off. I'd never been fired and never been furloughed. So I didn't even know what to do. I didn't even know who to go to. And yes, the company was amazing and giving me all these resources. But then you get into the the circle of the government world and trying to figure out how to file for unemployment. And then you get into the pandemic support of PPP, PUA, and all of that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, my brain is exploding with all this stuff. But at the same time, I had to maintain positive energy because my kids were spiraling too. And so I found that I had to really focus in on keeping me positive and doing things to keep me centered and grounded because if I didn't, I would just be starting to spiral with everything else. So I started really um, thinking deep inside and how I wanted to, the summer to play out because I basically was like, uh, what can I do here? I had to get a kid ready for college. My mom had just moved up to Chicago from Indiana. She'd never lived anywhere else in her entire life. I was all of a sudden grocery shopping for her every other day. And um, which was fine, but I was just like, wow. So I started to really think inside and um, try to figure out what I could do to keep everybody positive. And the hardest thing for me was I keep grounded from working out. And then my gym was taken away from me. And I hated that. I was like, this is awful. So I really started to um, think about things with um, my business life and my personal life and breaking it down in chunks and taking it day by day, everybody is in the same boat. There is not another person on this earth that is not dealing with this pandemic. And just having that self-talk and that really, the reassurance that I'm not alone, I'm, it's gonna be okay, you have people, don't isolate yourself, don't keep to yourself, get your feelings out. I know that's hard to do for a lot of people, but I'm really encouraging everybody to pick up that phone to that person that you haven't talked to in a while or just to be connected. I mean, this industry, is the, I have two passions in life professionally, the wellness industry and the events industry, and they were finally coming together because that was the work I was doing. But what I've bought out of both those industries, I have this huge network of people that I like as, as people, and I've really relied on them. And so that's been really helpful to me. And just let me trying to Let me Go ask ahead. you a question, Rachel and, and Mike. For, for the people who have a job, how do they help support those that don't? Like, you know, sometimes I will tell you, I felt really guilty at the beginning. I had a job and all my friends around me weren't. And I, I didn't know how to deal with that. And that really started to get to me. It still gets me. Mm -hmm now mm -hmm. but how how would you how would you want your friends and your colleagues to reach out to you or support you because like mike you were saying like you know your ego and the shame of saying oh, i lost my job but we're all in this together so what would be your advice to like the, that network around you to support you and help you 
I mean, I think for me, and and you know, this is this has been the phrase uh, my whole career is I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I've got so much going on. I got back to back meetings every day. I I got sick of myself saying that. Right. I think time, time for your friends, time for your family. I mean, I can I can assure you that you know um, when I lost my job the second time. And I was, uh, I was, I had to reinvent myself and get into consulting business, but I was looking to get back into corporate because corporate was comfortable for me. I can tell you how many people didn't have the time to just say, Hey, how you doing? Because they were too busy trying to protect their roles because they were going through reorganizations. And I think, I think giving your friends the time of day, it could be 10 minutes. Hey, I got 10 minutes. Love to hear how you're doing, mm-hmm. right? That, that for me, it's about time and, and and whether it's you know five minutes or an hour, make some time. I totally agree with that, Mike. When I was at the height of of traveling before all of this, you know, I felt more comfortable at an airport than I did at a PTA meeting, <laughs> and just not that was just not my thing. And um, and I've learned to kind of stop and really reach out and have people reach out, and I reach out. I mean, it's got to be a two way street. Because I think that, um, you know, we're on this, in the, our normal life, when we're in a non-pandemic world, this industry is fast and furious, and we don't stop. Um, we're always looking to the future, and we got to really look to today and really keep grounded in today, because obviously we don't know what tomorrow brings now. So, 100%. Kristen, yep. Kristen, you don't mind, I want to jump in. On yeah, this. please do. So, um, you know, I'm still employed right now. I can say two things that are happening in my situation. One is um, I am trying my best to ensure that none of my employees I have to furlough or uh, let go. So I, my mission is to ensure that our cash is where it needs to be and that sort of thing. So I think, you know, I, I look to those that are in leadership positions, try to do that as much as possible. You know, you know, take away whatever those fringe benefits are and so forth. That's, you know, eating the bottom line because the employees are the, the most, as we all know, the most important resource that you have. So that's what I've been trying to do and I'm going to continue to try to do um, throughout this process here. And then the uh, second thing in terms of, um, uh, and, and Mike and, and Rachel really hit it on the nose, is uh, still reach out. I mean, I, I have been very busy, so I haven't had the opportunity to reach out. But when individuals are reaching out to me, I will definitely put something on the calendar for us to sit there and talk. Um, I've had a number of colleagues that reached out to me who are in situations, again, they've been in jobs for 20, 30 years, and they just don't know what to do right now. And they just wanted some advice on, you know, what can they, what paths should they be taking? And so take those calls. Um, People reach out to you on LinkedIn, um, you know, asking for recommendations. Take the time to write that recommendation. I mean, I get, I know talking to those that are are very busy right now and, and, they're inundated with a lot of work, but, you know, think of it as, um, you know, you, you still have time in the evening. Um, so take your evening time to be able to, you know, help these individuals in that way. Um, I think it goes a long way when you do those type of things. Johnny, you're so right. And I will tell you um, at the beginning, I think, you know, what the, the, the best thing is the old school snail mail. I sent, you know, like a card, like it's nice to open your your mailbox and go, oh my gosh, somebody was thinking about me. Or uh, I had a colleague who was a contractor and she lost, you know, work, but she had a side business and I sent some of her boxes to some friends. So I felt like I was hoping, you know, helping two people. But I think you're, you're right, everybody has to reach out. But I love what you said because you are in a leadership position and from the financial part of what we're dealing with, like you're trying to keep your, your team in place, but then there's also the folks who are furloughed or reduced hours or lost their job. How do we start thinking about our financial care? I'd love for you to kind of, you know, help us frame that up. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there was a point in my career that I, I you know, left an organization. I wanted to, you know, rethink what I'm doing. And so I was in that situation when I didn't have a job. Um, and I tried to figure out, you know, how am I going to navigate? I have a, a family of two kids, wife, two dogs. Um, and I was, you know, the, the one that's, that um, brought, sort of supported that family. Um, so I was scared. Um, and I started with, you know, as everyone else is looking and trying to find, you know, where can I get unemployment? And and it is a strenuous process. It is a stressful process um, because it's so much paperwork that you have to fill out. Um, they don't get back to you in, in a timely fashion. Um, what I would say is just be patient. Um, 
and I and also in the guidebook there is we did list a number of the resources in the U.S. and outside the U.S. Uh, take the time to first read about what the process is, and we listed a number of those resources there. Um, and then um, be sure be be ready because um, it's going to take some time to go through that process. Um, again, there's a lot of paperwork you have to fill out. There's a lot of follow up that you have to do too. Um, you know. I hate to say it, but think about it on the side of the individuals that's taking this paperwork. They're inundated too. I mean, especially now where unemployment is such a high rate, um, they don't have a lot of resources there to get through all this paperwork. So, you know, keep that in mind and be patient throughout this process. Um, so you, you have the unemployment that you have to deal with and fill out the paper, and then the insurance. Um, you know, again, I had a family, I had to figure out, you know, how are we gonna deal with health insurance same thing. It is a long process. It's going to take some time. I, you know, all I say is just be patient um, because it, it it's going to take some time to get through it. And once you get through it and once you're in the system, things will work out and, and you'll be fine. But that beginning process is going to be a lot of work. Um, and I, I, all I say is just be patient throughout that process. And Johnny, one of the things that I've experienced through all of this is it's, it's bumpy. Um, you file once, for some reason, I got logged out and I had to file in a, uh, file again. And it's not, you don't think that it would be bumpy, but it can be. And you just have to take that patience pill <laughs> and really yeah. just. I mean, and, you know, going back to the time that, I, that, that this was happening, you know, I actually started to uh, take my mind off of that and try to do other things. One of the things that I thought of at that time was there have got to be other people out here that are worse off than I am. Um, so I ended up volunteering. I did a lot of volunteering during this time. I, um, you know, volunteered at the uh, food bank, you know, giving out food. Um, I ended up being a, which is kind of funny, but a um, aerobic instructor um, for, <laughs> uh, el uh, for the seniors um, at the pool, the local pool. I'm Johnny, you're, ki you're kind of a senior, Johnny. Let's be clear about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, so. but let's go there. <laughs> But it, it was, um, I, the reason I'm telling these stories, and, and I did some other tutoring and so forth, but I really love telling you stories. It really got my mind off of the struggles that I was going through. And then and, and being able to help these other individuals, it kind of made me feel good. It made me think, okay, you know, I'll get through this at some point. Because um, I know there's other individuals that are worse off than I am, and I'm seeing these individuals. And by me helping these individuals made me feel better. So, I, again, I, I, that's another tip I would – you know, uh, promote, you know, it's a li little different time now with COVID and so forth, but if you can volunteer, um, it really helps during this process too. You know, that, per that perspective, you know, mine is if we think about our industry and all the people in it, um, there's a lot of people hurting that are on this webinar right now and going through a lot of change, but there's a whole section of people, the front lines of our industry, the, the bellmen, the, the cooks, the waiters, those people live paycheck to paycheck and they have been decimated. So um, we, we do have challenges, everyone on this call to different degrees, but those people that have been impacted have been really impacted. So for me personally, I jumped into Above and Beyond Foundation and uh, was spent practically full time through the first part of the summer on raising money. We think about $300,000 now for people on the front lines. That does not help us, but it does help us to Johnny's point because now we're we're at least empowering ourselves with an ability to help others that are even worse off than, you know, the people on this call may be. You know what, Tony, and I think on that, it feels good. It just feels good to go out there yeah, and help does. somebody. You know, I mean, there's just something magical about that that you can't put a price tag on. It's just something, I don't know, it feels good. Yeah. And also, I think your value goes up when you connect people. Yeah. It just does. I mean, you know, it's just a good It's, it's a little selfish, actually. It's, it's yeah, selfless, it is. but it it's is. a little bit selfish because we do get good feelings out of it. So it's a there's win -win. There's science behind when you give, you get a better feeling inside. Yeah. So yeah. it's it being, giving is, is the best way of healing. I agree wholeheartedly. I'd love to say, I love your idea, Johnny. Right. Go out and give, uh, support other people, see other people that need your support, right? Um, one thing that I chose to do, uh, because again, me trying to start a consulting firm and continue with that and grow it, uh, my comfort level continues to be wanting to be in corporate and have that big bear behind me, right? Um, I, I have been hearing so many people talk about how they keep applying for jobs and applying for jobs, and they're trying to transition their, re, re, their, their skill set currently to move into another role. At the end of the day, and I'm going to be honest about this, my success when I have gotten a new role 
in corporate America, it has been because I have found the hiring manager and got my resume through a friend who was able to put my resume in front of it. 80, and, and I just took a, I took a class on this back in March, is that you know 70% of the people that are out there applying for jobs blindly and don't have a relationship with anybody at the company, you're probably not gonna get a call, right? And I think that's, that's part of the thing that you have to really start looking at. It's like, okay, you see a great job you want, you need to figure out who you know or who the third person down the road that might have a relationship with them who can get your resume in front of that person. But I made the, I made the fact that I, I was traveling so much and I was on the road all the time that I wanted to start focusing on my family. And so I made the decision, I am no longer gonna look for corporate America right now because I don't think people are gonna be hiring. And right now it's end of September, beginning of October. If you're not gonna get a job by October 31st, you might as well forget about November and December because nobody's gonna be hiring during the holidays and everyone's gonna be on, on holiday. So try to figure out how do you either go out and volunteer, continue to keep busy, maybe do some, try to get some consulting work or, or do a, d a day job, maybe stuffing packets for people that actually are doing programming and sending out. That would be a recommendation. You know, we're all, I know we got to move on, Chris. Just a quick, 75% of people's jobs are found through your professional network. 75%. I mean, that's a huge. So just kind of. Remember that. Sorry, Kristen. I just I want to get no, that out there. Uh, no, because I I because I, I want to get to to Tony on this career. But I will tell you, Rachel and I have a mutual friend who did that just that. A friend left the industry and went into kind of the senior living care. She needed something to do a couple days a week. Started working there, and guess what? That led to a job in a different industry in sales and marketing. So just think about that volunteer job. I mean, Johnny may you know be teaching swim lessons to the seniors someday. You know, who knows? But Tony, I'd love to hear from you. You have had I feel like nine lives of <laughs> and. I feel like you've reinvented yourself and I know there's a lot of people on the chat who have like said, listen, now I feel like I'm overqualified. I have all of my, you know, accreditations. I've been in the industry, you know, 20 plus years, or maybe I'm getting right. close to retirement and I got laid off. What do I do? And I just feel like you have had such an amazing career. Like I'd love to hear how, you know, some of, of what you've had to go through and, and, and what you would suggest. Well, you, to people. Yeah, thank you, Chris. You, you look at careers and I have, personally look at them in chapters and I've had several of them. I'm like Johnny older than dirt in some respects, but it's been a, it's been a fun ride primarily because I found my passion. Uh, I love events and so many people on this call love events. I love the value, value they create and everything about them. And I always have my entire life. So if there's one thought, you know, whatever you do, make sure it's around your passion because if it's not around your passion, I mean, let's face it, we spend most of our lives in, work mode some way somehow to, to Mike's point so if you're not doing what you love then get out whatever it is um, no matter what your situation is the money will follow so when it comes to you know that's my first theme really when I when you think about people that have been around a long time and have a, an advanced uh, chapter in their in their career story wisdom counts in times like this and if you've been around you've got a ton of wisdom there's no question about it and there's not a uh, book on the planet that's going to tell you otherwise. On the other side of that, if you're earlier in your career, say you're a recent college grad, there's probably no better time to get into an industry than when it's going to be undergoing seismic change. And obviously our industry is going through change. So if you're just coming out of school, for me, and I, I, I talk with a lot of students at SDSU and other schools and programs in our industry, and, and they're excited and they have a mindset that is beautiful for walking into this industry. So on the two the bookends of careers, for different reasons, there's, there's opportunity. But that doesn't really come into play unless you have, you have the ability to get through tough times. To Mike's point and others, grit is a, is a real thing. And if you don't have it, um, you're likely not going to get what you want out of life. Setbacks happen. I've started two businesses and two recessions, and both uh, went beautifully eventually. But there were setbacks on the front end, no question about it. And you gotta get through them. Um, thirdly, I think about consistency and uh, the best practices are, and habits are happen, are they, you get them on the back of consistency. And what we've done with this task force, not just in workforce and well-being, but in the broader task force, is giving you a wealth of tools that are, have come, are coming today, will come forward in other subjects, that if you dive into those tools, developed and curated by this task force, you're gonna be valuable as an employee, as a business owner, 
whatever it is that you, whatever track you want to take. If you're a business owner, I would suggest you think about, do you want to build a business that can run without me one day? Or do you want to be a sole practitioner? And there are definitely pros and cons to both of those tracks, but think about that early. Um, I chose to build businesses and you know, it was, there was definitely setbacks. There are definitely uh, challenges made, sacrifices, life experiences I didn't have because I was running a business. Um, but, you know, it but does work out what, in the end. What happens when you're like an independent or a small business owner, like you said, right. and it's like, there is no business. Like, do, do, do you just close up shop? Do you try and reinvent yourself? Like there's been a couple, you know, yeah. chats on that. I'm just curious. What, what, what are you thinking about that? Well, we, it is extraordinary right now. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I left PRA as CEO a year ago or so. And, uh, took some, took a time, just took a break for a while. And, um, lately I've been doing a little bit of consulting. Um, there is opportunity out there. And I'll go back to the point that I think Tim made, you know, everybody has called me to different degrees is your network counts. And, uh, you, there is opportunity. Don't think there isn't a blanket statement that there's just nothing out there is defeatist. So there are things to do. This industry is sort of going through seismic change, as I said, and, with change comes need and with need comes opportunity. So throughput on, on investigating and getting in front of your network uh, is a relentless approach to finding that path, maybe not the permanent path, but at least a temporary path to get you around the base paths is they're there. It is there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting out and getting after it. So Tim, I'd love to bring you in on this because you and I have a big love of Brene Brown. <laughs> And I know, like, you know, we were talking a little, a little bit about the social connection and, you know, Tony's touching on it now and, and Greto talked about it. Like, how do you keep your network? Like, you know, I had a friend at the beginning of the year, she had like no um, LinkedIn connections and she was a salesperson in the industry. I'm like, girlfriend, you need to get that up and going. <laughs> And so whether it's your professional web network or what we call our family or work family or, you know, personal friends, like how do we, how do we manage all of this? Cause it's a lot. No, I think it is a lot. And you know, it's funny cause even I think I'm a little different than some of the people here. I've been doing the same job for over 20 years. I've been booking speakers for 20 some years and you know, kind of what rates right, came February, March, I was successful. And by successful, I mean, happy. I liked what I'm doing, you know, at a roof over my head. I still do, but you know, but my job changed a lot. So it really, I needed some kind of support because I wasn't traveling. I wasn't connecting with people like I did before. That was hard for me. I'm social. I'm outgoing. Now I'm working way more hours and my W-2 is not the same as it was. You know, it's, it sucks. You know, at the same time, I'm very fortunate. You don't feel bitter because I do have a job, but it's not what I signed up for and what I've been doing and been happy doing. That's where I think I needed my social network. You well, know, I'm pretty connected. Go ahead, Mike. No, sorry, I was going to add to what you're saying, Tim. I completely agree with you. I mean, when you sit down and think about, you know, your W-2 sucks. Yeah, my W-2 sucks right now. It is awful. And I'm sure <laughs> there's millions of others at W-2s that suck. You either have nothing or you're getting the, you know, the two-week uh, from being unemployed. At the, at the end of the day, I don't know, for me, it has been, and this sounds crazy, you guys, but like my wife has always, for whatever's happened as a, as her, to her as an entrepreneur, she has always followed like the universe, the universe and the angels, like put good out there. It's going to come back to you. It may not happen when you want it, but just put good back, good, yeah. good back there. Yeah. I think that's a huge thing. Cause Tim, you sound like you're right. W2 sucking right now, but at the end of the day, are you happier than where you once were? Cause I can assure you that I am much closer to my family over the last seven months and I have been in the last 18 years. And that's a hard thing to say publicly. No, and I agree with that. And that's what I was saying. My, my network, I need that. Like the meeting industry, I'm like Tony and Rich. I love this industry and I feel more connected with them there. My speaker bureau community, which they're my competitors, but I feel more connected with them just from social, you know, my family too. I'm home more. I'm not traveling. So there's a connection there. And even my colleagues at Speak Inc. We talk more now than we did the last 20 years because we need each other. There's a need and a want there. But, you know, kind of what, you know, Kristen on the social network, you know, I use a line, you know, it's, you're planting seeds, you're not hunting when it comes to social. You're planting seeds, you're not hunting. Because you got to put different things out there, you know. And I think it's hard because sometimes, you know, I think with LinkedIn is a good idea. I have people who sometimes reach out. Let's put it this way. A professional speaker, they want to work with me. They'll reach out. I'll see if we have people in common. I'll connect. And then the next thing I know, they want me to book them all over the place. You know, don't go from first date to marriage. You know what I mean? you got to build that relationship. It's hard but you got to build that relationship. And I think sometimes, and I get it because you're 
unemployed or you're in a tough spot, but you can't just go from A to Z right away. And I think that's kind of one of the tough spots with social. I think the other thing, just be authentic, be real, be vulnerable, you know, be humble. You know, I think that's going to make that connection happen. You know, it's the Brene thing. When you're vulnerable, people feel more connected to you. And I think that's just huge in this industry with what you're doing with social media. It is your friend. I know sometimes some of us have, you know, Zoom fatigue. I get that too, but I play in a money light poker league with my friends. I can't get enough of this just because I feel connected virtually. You know, that's what I look forward to through my week, even though I'm on a million calls all day, but it's just keep that positive mindset. And I think people can connect with you virtually. You know, I know I've known Rachel for years when she lost her job You know, I wish I would have seen her at an event and went and gave her a hug and go, you know, but I can't, but you know, you connect on Facebook or social, whatever it is. Instagram, Insta, as the kids call it, you know, just put Tim, a little be, be happy glad face and go. Be glad your nickname's not No Friends Lorenz, which mine is. I got a real deep <laughs> photo to pull out of. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys, we have um, the last 15 minutes. We were going to open it up for questions um, because, again, th- there's such, you know, a great conversation. And I'm seeing in that in the chat because I think the authenticity and transparency is really good. So I'd love everybody, if you have um, specific questions to, to put in here, I think one of the questions, uh, I, I'm going to go back to career, is that, you know, when we, um, we're balancing a lot, you know, and the people who are still working, so we had half the people are still working, and now you have kids at home, so now you're running a school, you're running, you know, um, a, a kitchen, you know, a restaurant, because now you're cooking, you're exercising, you're managing your job and sharing space, like how how do we, how do you balance all of this? Cause it's a lot. And, you know, again, I'm a single, single person with two fur dogs. That's the only thing I have to deal with, but I watch my colleagues and friends. It's a lot of pressure. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, Tony can kick us off and I'd love any other insights. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate. You know, my kids are out of in school and um, you know, I, I don't have the pressure. I can't imagine what it's like to put kids through school at the age of 10 and 12 and 14. And, and I don't know how that even works to be honest with you, but it is working. And um, I, I'd ask someone with a, with experience in that and in that mindset or in that place right now to see what, what their view is. I, uh, I don't know how Brad, to do it. I, I have a teenager. I, I have three, I have three kids. I'm married. I have three kids. I have oh. a senior, a freshman and a okay. uh, sixth grader. So, I mean, it's, it's busy at my house. And it's, it's, but it's, you know, it's, it's good. I, I, I don't really believe in balance. I don't think you can really, for me, I'm not a, right. I'm not the most organized person mm-hmm. either. So I think it's hard to, but I think you just got to find those moments. Mm-hmm. And I think you got to recognize them. To me, that's the way you, I look at it. You know, when, you know, at the end of the day, I'll come up and we'll all kind of sit around, someone's cooking and then three of us sit around the island, the five of us together and they're doing homework and I'm doing my work and, you know, my wife's there, we got some music going. To me, that's just like, it could be five, 10 minutes. It's just, there's a connection there. And to me, yeah. that's what it's about. But, you know, it's taking the breath during the day, but I think it's hard to, especially now, you're not going to find that organization you're looking for. And then you got to let go and just try to find those magic moments. The, the, the I think, you, oh, sorry, Tani, go ahead. Well, the comment I was going to say, and, and I'm, uh, my kids are older too, so I don't, I'm not dealing with this, but well, I will say, I mean, it's, we look back, you know, six, nine months um, ago, we were very, very busy. You know, we're traveling the world and doing all these different things. We're working all these crazy hours and so forth. And now life slowed down. And now we're in this whole new norm where we're at home with our kids and so forth. Again, this might sound crazy, but appreciate it because you didn't have this before. You are now really getting to know your kids. They're getting to know you. Um, and it's really now family. I mean, family time and that sort of thing, because we didn't have that. We were all so busy with our phones and doing all the different things. And now we're really getting to know the kids. The kids are getting to really know us. So, again, I, this may sound crazy because you're in the middle of all this, but take the time to appreciate it because there will be a time we're going to get back to this craziness and we're not going to have this time anymore. We're going to look back and say, oh, gosh, you know, I missed out on this. I missed out on that. And that's a great point. Yeah. Crazy, Sorry, that's a huge crazy. point because – when you come back to it and you do get your job again and you get back into the industry, how has this moment with your family going to affect you as you move forward? What right. are you going to right. do differently? You don't want to and regret it. It's a struggle, for, I think, for all of us. Right. You don't want to regret it. I think it. one of the things that is really important is you're teaching your kids life lessons of how you're de- dealing with stress, how you're managing and multitasking. Lead by example for your kids if they're young and watching. 
um, because they're, they are watching. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things I had the luxury of working home, from home for the last 20 years. So I didn't have that um, shift, if you will. But I'm, what I've noticed over my kids growing up and watching me work from home, they've noticed how I balance and how I, I can uh, be at multiple personas, if you will, to, to the, you know, a work person, a mom, uh, a caretaker for my mom. And so, but the kids are all watching and it's really good to lead by example, but you know, they're also coming up with some pretty amazing ideas as well and embrace those and listen to them. Cause when we're busy, we don't listen to all those ideas as, as much. Mm -hmm. And so really I saw somebody put, um, their kid was struggling with school, so they took their bike who had training wheels and put their tennis shoes on the training wheels and let the kid ride the oh, bike yeah, while it was on, um, while on Zoom classes. I mean, it's just some really cool creative things that people are trying to balance themselves and their, their stresses and their family. So, <clears throat> and everything yeah, I, 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 I just want to make sure we address those that don't have a, have like a, a family. I am a single person. I'm sure there's, you know, single people out there. I don't have a spouse. I don't have children. My parents live far away. And that is one thing I've struggled with is that, you know, when you're shelter in place for three months, right. I finally oh. went home for a month to be near my parents because it started to get to me. So I think that there are people out there that are also single and, and don't have either the luxury or the frustration to be sequestered with right. your spouse for you know a long time. There's sometimes I go, oh, I'm glad I'm not. But I think that like that also I want to address those people who are out there and don't have that immediate network and how you really do, to Tim's point, you're going to have to push yourself out there to find that and bring them in because it, it was starting to get a little much because you were listening to everybody else lose their job and you have a job and then you're not near your family. So I just want to make sure we, we touch on those that, that, you know, don't have that, that network too. Sorry, go ahead, Tony. That's the opportunity to that question. That's the opportunity to reach out. I've got a lot of friends that are in that, in that place. And um, I've tried to reach out to as many as I can uh, because you, they, they, you can just get clear with what's going on with your own life. But perspective is, it's tough. I mean, it's tough on every level with everyone. And so I've got five or six of my very close friends that are in the same category of life place you are, Kristen, and I've become closer to them over the last six months, more so than any time over the last, in most cases, 25 years. So, and I think the other thing is, is there are people that are married that are not in happy marriages <laughs> that are going through this pandemic. And that's really, you know, you've really got to get into um, thinking about other people and helping other people because they're going to need, we all need each other. And so it's really important to stay connected. Yeah, I think that's the main thing, connected, be it married, single, you know, whatever it might be, just connect with people five minutes a day, text, email, whatever it might be, just say hi. And that's a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, that's the human nature, as we all know. That's what drives us is connections. So I saw I saw a chat a question of text about on text or the chat about um, competing with others when you've been around for a good bit of time. You got a lot of chapters with people that are younger. Um, to me, uh, again, as I said earlier, wisdom counts. You got way more wisdom than someone just coming out of school. They've got other skill sets, by the way, you may not have, but you do have wisdom and you have a network. Uh, you've got people and resources and relationships that you can leverage that someone that's a good bit younger may not have. And on the other side, as someone, if you are younger in this audience, then you've got flexibility of thinking and new ideas and thoughts, and you don't have the baggage of 30 years of a career and how to go about building events, what have you, that will be helpful to this industry. So the mashup of the two for different reasons, both are in equal places of opportunity. And Tony, you and Johnny have lots of wisdom. So I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> you know, lots of years, not about wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we just have um, about five, six minutes left. I would love each one of you to kind of help wrap up. What's helped you through um, the last, you know, six months and kind of what your hope is for the future. Um, I, I, I'll start. I, I will tell you one of the things that changed my life uh, was this one saying that it's the five by five rule. If it's not going to matter in five years, why are you wasting five minutes on it? And to me, that was such a game changer when I saw that. I was like, you're right. Why am I fretting and, you know, being so upset about something that I'm not even remember 
you know, in five years. And I think my hope is that this reset, whatever this great reset we've all gone through to Johnny's point is how we've reconnected with, you know, friends and family and supportive of the industry. And I hope that continues that when things get back to normal and we get back into that crazy world that Greta, you know, has told us that we still remember that. That's my hope. Mm -hmm. Tony, you want to kick us off? Sure. I, uh, I'll go with what, I, what I'm hopeful for and what I, I do believe will happen. I think our industry is, as I said earlier, it's, it's the most powerful media on the planet, period. And so to the extent that we, and it is to the extent that we do, we may or may not, I think we will embrace uh, digital and physical and all that comes with those channels. The power of that can make this industry way bigger, way better, way more powerful than it was in January of this year. And it was pretty powerful then. Um, we do have to, as an industry, embrace this new approach, which is really not a new approach, but for many, a new approach to the delivery of content and commerce and community through the media of events. We're just going to have another channel in which to do it, make sure that's highly coordinated with what we've been used to doing in terms of the physical channel. But I think the, the opportunity for this industry to be enormous and even more powerful is right in front of us. Mike? Oh, yeah, me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I think one overall arching thing that has I've just really been thinking about the last seven months is our industry hasn't changed since the Flintstones. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have not changed the way we go about business. I mean, we might do things a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, trade shows are trade shows, citywide are citywide. How do we start rethinking and retooling, right? That's my first piece that I've kind of been really contemplating daily over the last seven months, because now we have a whiteboard. Uh, the one thing that I would really go through right now is um, being in the present. <laughs> Sorry, somebody, my dog just got in, so just hurry <laughs> off for a minute. Um, being in the present, I have been one to actually look forward and move forward to um, always worrying about the future or why, you know, thinking about the past or where I once was. At the end of the day, staying present is key. And also the final thing is understanding uncomfortable. You have to learn how to be uncomfortable. I have been uncomfortable every day for the last seven months, and uh, it's not easy, but I will tell you that it's something that you have to start to embrace and move forward. That's it. That's all I got. That's awesome. <laughs> Tim, I'm going to go to you and then I'm going to let Rachel and Johnny um, close it out. Tim? Sure. I, like Tony said, I love this industry and I hope, you know, we're able to kind of meet face to face again. But my big thing, I, honestly, is the Stockdale paradox. That's kind of where I've been <laughs> looking at. If you haven't heard that, Google <laughs> Jim Collins, he redid it. But basically, Admiral Stockdale, prisoner of war in Vietnam. I'll try to make this quick. And again, Google Jim Collins, he tells it much better than I do. But, you know, as a prisoner of war, you know, these people were like, I want to get out by December, by Christmas, whatever it might be. And then when they didn't, they didn't do so well because they had to set like an end date on it. And Stockdale's point is he lived every day at the moment and he was going to, you know, live each day and not just worry about kind of what the future held because he can't control that. And he didn't put an end date on, you know, his prisoner of war or COVID, whatever you want. To me, it's just living every day as it is and doing the best I can with it every day and, you know, see what happens. Love that. Johnny. Uh, well, go ahead, Rachel, then I'll go. Um, for me, the key takeaway for us is making sure you create balance for yourself. Um, my priority continuing moving forward is to make sure that our industry professionals take good care of themselves because when events do come back, we need to have a different perspective and really creating a balance for the industry professional, making sure you take the time out for yourself. And one tip that I've really loved this time off that I've had is I listen to Audible books all the time. And it's just one thing that I really, really enjoyed. Um, people think I'm listening to music all the time, but I'm listening to books. So there you go. Cool. And, and I'll end with um, you can't control the uncontrollable. Keep that in right. mind. This is a time where you can pause and just control the things you can control. What you can control is your interactions with your family. What you can control is your interactions with other people. So reach out and, and create those connections. I think that's the one thing that I have found um, that's inspired me is the connections that I'm making and, and connections to individuals that I haven't talked to in years. Um, it's been great to catch up with these individuals and, and talk about you know what they've been doing. Because again, we've been so busy, we haven't had the opportunity to do that. So this is that time that you can do that. And again, as I stated, you can't control the uncontrollable because that's what we are right now. It's, it's unprecedented times. We don't know exactly what's going on. So let's not worry about that. Let's just control what we can control and those connections are things that we can control. 
I, I totally agree with you, Johnny. And I loved connecting with all of you. It's been great working on this. Um, I see the chats and everybody has loved the authenticity and the transparency. And I am hoping that Amy and team will invite us back because I think this is needed. We are going to be creating some industry um, circles, which are just these natural conversations on topics. So I know the chat is full of conversations and some folks have asked, can we take that chat offline? We're going to. So um, I want to thank my panelists and the, the chairs for putting this together in this committee. I think this has just been a great hour spent. I want to invite Amy back on so she can just kind of close us out. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome. And Amy, over to you. Thanks, Kristen. So honestly, for me, I loved being a participant today and listening to all your stories. I knew that um, the time would really be well received because of your willingness to share and be so vulnerable. And I, and I just, I got a little teary eyed to be honest with you. So if I'm looking a little, <laughs> you know, emotional, it's because I am, but I just want to let you all know how much I appreciate, you know, what you've shared today. And I love seeing the response on the chat. So well done everybody. And thank you again for not just the time today, but all your work put into this resource. I think it's really going to be fantastic. And, I have a bit of a micro, but I think I just want to let you know close out today with um, the reminder to the audience that we'll be sending everybody a link to the guide on wellness um, and uh, the workforce. And uh, we also want to remind everybody that the EIC website is where all this content resides. We have updated our career center as well as posting this this guide. So there's tremendous um, resources embedded within that website about job opportunities, whether that be full-time or project or consultancy related opportunities. So please visit the website and um, continue to stay in touch. I really believe that this is an opportunity for, for us to come out of this a stronger industry, more committed to our values. And this task force really was focused from the very beginning on tr building trust, community, um, and innovation and adaptations, and of course, um, the innovations that we need to move forward. But it starts with our hearts and the value that we place on the relationships that we have with one another. And so I encourage you all to continue to reach out and build those networks and build those relationships. And if you're feeling um, disconnected to try to use the various resources to build those connections. And um, I can be, um, if I can be of any support, please let me know. But I would, I would share with you one resource that I love. And, and my daughter gave this to me um, a few years ago when I was going through a bit of a transition. And it's a book uh, called uh, Becoming Wise by Krista Tippett. And she has a fantastic podcast. So that's my little snippet. I love um, her work. And um, I encourage you all to stay optimistic, even though we're going through a tough time. I do believe we're going to come out of this stronger. So thank you for being with us. Thank you to all of our amazing thought leaders for your wonderful stories today and everything that you do. And to the participants, take care of yourselves, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>